Hello fellow fly fishers and future fellow fly fishers. Welcome back to my 10 part series on fly fishing for beginners. Today is part four. We're gonna talk about entomology as it relates to fly fishing. We're gonna focus on the beginner. So there's two objectives uh, that I would hope to emphasize in this uh, part four. One would be that as a beginner, you'll be able to identify the major groups of insects. And two, after you've identified uh, an insect, you'll be able to select a fly that represents that insect. Now, why should you watch this? Um, because you don't want to be like me. What I used to do was just go down to the water and tie on a fly and start fishing. Um, you want to be observant when you get down to the water before you fish. You want to look at the vegetation. You want to look at the ground all around you, the surface of the water. Pay particular attention subsurface. Now if you're at a stream or a river, you want to find a shallow riffly area where there's a lot of broken surface uh, water and you'll just simply go down and pick up some rocks and look for insects. If you want to invest a little money and time or both, you can uh, get a big screen like something like this. And what you'll do with this, it's just a screen with handles, you'll take this stick it down on the bottom of the stream or river in the Riffley area, uh, move around, shuffle your feet, move rocks around, uh, hopefully you'll dislodge some insects. And if you have a container with you, put a little water in the bottom, dump the uh, contents into the container, and then watch and look for insects. Now if you're in a fertile area, you're going to be surprised at the quantity you find. So the idea here would be is to pick a uh, the, the insect that's the, the most numerous and then try to pick a fly that represents that insect. Now as a beginner I'm always emphasized dry fly fishing so if you see a bunch of nymphs in here and there's a lot of them you'll want to pick a nymph that represents the majority of those insects and then you'll use a dry dropper. Now this bug net can be a handy tool also uh, they sell these commercially made this you can use to scoop, obviously, insects out of the air, off vegetation, the surface of the water, most importantly, as things drift by. Great tool to have. So we're gonna focus on uh, four insects that are probably the most important to a trout's diet, and then a fifth, a fifth cat, was really a category of insects. But we're gonna look at mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies, midges, and then the category of insects, we're gonna look at terrestrials, which are gonna be grasshoppers, beetles, ants, and crickets, not spiders so much. Although the English used to call their wet fly patterns spiders, so go figure. But anyway, we're not gonna look at spiders. Now let's just get some terminology out of the way. Uh, when I say larva or nymph, I mean the initial stage of the insect's life where it's living on the bottom of the body of water. If I say a merger, what I mean is the insect is now pupating, rising through the water column to the surface of the water to turn into a winged adult and fly away in the cases of most insects. There are a few exceptions which we'll get to. If I say a dun, I'm talking about a mayfly that has just emerged from its nymphal shuck and is now sitting on the surface of the water waiting for its wings to dry or inflate and fly away. And when I talk about spinners, I'm talking about uh, mayflies, the stage of their life that uh, where they have flown away as a dun to some vegetation or some other surface, molted into what they call a spinner. Then it will come back to the water surface to lay its eggs, and then eventually it will die, and it'll become a can be a spent mayfly or a still a spinner in that point. But they're spent caddis and spent stoneflies, where after they lay their eggs and they die, their wings will extend and they'll float on the surface of the water like this. So that's a little bit about some terminology. So let's take a look at the first insect on the list, which is the mayfly. Mayflies are, uh, they have a very wide ranging habitat. They're all over the place. I even have them landing on my house. I live nowhere near a body of water. Stages, or the four important stages of the mayfly's life cycle are gonna be in the nymphal stage when it's subsurface, and then as an emerger when it's coming up to the top, leave its nymphal shell. So it's wiggling out of its uh, nymphal shell to turn into a, an adult. 
and then when it's floating on the surface right after it comes out of its shell waiting for its wings to dry uh, or inflate and fly away and then finally as it comes back to the water to lay its eggs those are the four stages you really want to be thinking about when you're when you're fly fishing now it's the only aquatic insect with upright wings so that's how you're going to identify adult you're going to look for them on vegetation you're going to see them flying around you're going to see them landing on the water if you see them laying on the water like this with their wings out that's a spent mayfly that had just laid its eggs <coughs> so you that's when you would fish a spent mayfly pattern as i said earlier in the introduction the whole purpose of this is eventually to be able to figure out what insects are in the water that the fish are eating and to match your fly to those insects. Now there's a wide range of sizes for mayflies. Sizes four, which is large, maybe a little over an inch, to size 28, which is very small. Uh, for you as a beginner, I'll stay away from the small sizes. If you're gonna fish a lake, uh, try to find a fly shop or somebody that's fished here before because you'll probably wanna get larger sizes than I'm gonna recommend. So you may wanna deviate from that. And then as a rule of thumb as you fish, if you're fishing early in the year in the spring, the mayfly hatches, the species that hatch, tend to be a little larger than the ones that, that uh, hatch in the fall. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, I think that's it. Let's take a look at some pictures and uh, of different life cycles of the mayfly so you can identify them when you come across them. Okay, let's talk about the second fly on the list, which is the caddis. Now, in a tailwater situation, you're fishing in a tailwater, the caddis can go right to the top of the list. They're gonna be more important, likely, than the mayfly to the trout's diet. So there's little complexities uh, to fishing caddis imitations, but let me just talk about the four stages of caddis life that are gonna be important to you when you're fly fishing. One is when they're larva on the bottom of the stream or river, Two is when they're pupating, coming up through the water column to the surface to leave their shell behind and turn into a winged adult. Three, when they come back to lay their eggs. And four, when they've laid their eggs and now have expired and they're called a spent caddis on the surface of the water. So those are four important stages of the caddis's life. Uh, the things that make it difficult to fish or can be tricky, but there are some saving graces, which I'll get to at the end. There's three ways caddis deposit their eggs depending on the species. Some come back to the water, land on the water, and then just deposit their eggs as they're floating on the surface. There's other species that skitter across the surface of the water and deposit their eggs. That's when you want to move, uh, add a little movement to your, your fly, which will be a dry fly. And the third type dives down below the surface of the water to deposit their eggs and then comes back up. That's when you're going to want to use a wet fly. We've talked about in part three, and then we'll talk about the fly to use in part five. Now, the other complexity here is there's three types of larva. There's cased caddis that builds a case out of debris or little rocks on the bottom and lives in that case. There's something called a net spinner. They spin a little net, they live in that net. And the fourth is a free living caddis that crawls around the rocks. Uh, the latter two are probably more important, I would say, but fish will eat all three types of larva. Now the saving grace to the caddis is you don't need a wide selection of sizes to represent the caddis. Uh, sizes 14 through 18 will represent most species, unlike the mayfly which was like size 4 or 28. Uh, and there's a there's one particular fly uh, it's called an elk care caddis. It, it's a all-time favorite of many people. I like to fish that fly. It represents multiple species. It, it can be fished with a dry dropper. Um, it, it's just an excellent productive pattern. So we'll talk about that too in part five. So now let's take a look at some photographs of the caddis who have its life cycle so you can identify them when you come across them.
Okay, the third most important insect to a trout's diet are stoneflies. Of course, that depends where you're fishing. They do prefer fast, rocky water, so highly, highly oxygenated, clean water. So you're mostly going to find stoneflies in your higher elevation streams and rivers. Now the uh, interesting thing, one of the interesting things is if you're fishing and you see a lot of uh, empty shells or shucks on rocks or logs, that's those are most likely stoneflies that came out of the water to hatch. They actually crawl out of the water and then they leave their nymphal shuck and turn into adults on dry land, unlike, unlike the caddis and most mayflies. So that comes in advantage when you're fishing a nymph. As a beginner, you're just gonna dead drift the nymph. Although I'm only gonna have a couple nymphs for you to uh, use as a beginner, because mostly I would like you to dry fly fish. And the good thing about stone flies is there's not this wide range of sizes, 12 to 20 cover most species of stone flies. So uh, if you caught some, let's say you're collecting insects, you've got some in the container, how are you gonna know it's a stone fly? Well, versus a mayfly, because they can look similar. Uh, the stonefly nymphs are generally going to be a little larger, uh, depending, but they're also very poor swimmers. So mayfly nymphs can dart around in here. These guys are just crawlers. They really can't swim too well. They kind of move their arms around, maybe undulate some, but that's one way to tell. Plus, they're going to always have two tails. And if you catch them in the later stages, you know, I didn't talk about I don't even need to talk about wing pads at this point in the game, but they look different, there's two. So uh, I'm going to suggest a couple dry flies for you. If you see an insect uh, land on the water, so some stone flies land on the water, lay their eggs, and they actually run back on the surface of the water to land and then fly away again and repeat that process. So that's the time that you want to skitter your dry fly across the water a little bit, which is most of them, I think I've talked about techniques you want to dead drift. These you'll actually want to skitter a little bit across the water to elicit a strike from fish. So uh, I think that's it for these guys. Um, really only two stages where you can catch fish on them is when they're nymphs in the water and when they come back to lay their eggs. Okay, so let's look at some photographs of stoneflies in their, uh, through their life cycle. Okay, let's talk about the fourth insect on our list, which is the almighty midge. Now, midges have a wide-ranging habitat. They're, from, they're in still waters to fast-moving waters. They particularly are very prolific on tail waters and spring creeks and a lot of rivers also. There's three stages of the midge's life that are important to you. One, when they're larva. Two is when they're pupating, rising to the surface to turn into an adult. And three, is when they're adults and they come back and they call it's a, a bunch of cluster of midges basically mating on the surface of the water flying together where the trout will eat a cluster of midges because they can be very small on a tailwater so typical sizes for midges and fly sizes are 14 through 28 and generally in a, in a still water you're going to have larger midges and in a spring creek, you're going to have smaller, or a river, smaller midges. Again, that's rule, general rule of thumb. It's also, midges come in a bunch of different colors. Uh, red, black, olive, green, cream, yellow. I'm going to recommend probably red and black, as those are probably the two most common colors. Again, now it depends on where you're fishing. There's all kinds of, it depends, in fly fishing. So I'll say it depends on where you're going to fish, on what color. Uh, a fly you're going to want to use. Now midges are really the only true fly. We call all these things we go fishing with flies, but in reality a midge is the only true fly. Anyway, let's take a look at some photographs of the midge. So when you come across them while you're fishing, you'll know what they are.
Okay, the last insects we're going to talk about are really, uh, I have a grouping of insects. So the terrestrials, the grasshoppers, ants, crickets, beetles, and uh, spiders, even I don't think spiders are, are as important to the trout's diet. Um, at least I haven't fished with any spiders. Grasshoppers, during the right time of the year, are really important to use uh, if you're gonna fish in, uh, especially in grassy areas, or if you see grasshoppers when you're, when you're headed to the water. Uh, good to use, all these are good to use as dry droppers too, because all of these are going to be fished uh, as a dry fly, because none of these, of course, are aquatic insects. But they, they are very important to the trout certain times of the year, so especially in the summer months when you know it's hot and the water levels are low and there's not a lot of things that are hatching and um, you think, uh, hey, maybe trout season, I need to give it a rest until the fall. That's when you want to go out and fish with some terrestrials. And grasshoppers are so popular, as a matter of fact, you know, that's where the term hopper dropper came from, where you fish with a grasshopper and then a nymph below. Also, I have a little story about grasshoppers. Uh, first time I ever fly fished, uh, went to the fly shop and a guy said, well, take some of these and take some of these and, and head up to this, you know, this little river. It was up in the high Sierras. Uh, it was a mountain meadow. And I used a grasshopper and I was just there at the right time of the year, of course, because I had the right fly. And I, I did really well that day. And usually the first time you fly fish, eh, you know, it's, it's, it can be tough. Don't get discouraged though, it's all about having fun. But I, I did catch quite a few fish. I was hooked on fly fishing. Okay, let's take a, well, I, I, maybe we'll look at a few pictures of these and um, then we'll come back and we'll wrap it all up. Okay, let's wrap up part four. So what are the key takeaways that I hope I emphasized in this video? One is you need to be observant and then investigate. So slow down before you get out there, when you get out on the water, slow down, take some time, look around on the vegetation, on the surface of the water, pick up some rocks or, or try to collect some insects with the screen if you have one. And then hopefully after you've collected some insects or observed some insects, you'd be able to identify those and then select a fly that closely resembles those insects. So when we get to part five, we're gonna talk about fly selection. We're gonna tie that back in to some of the insects we've talked about in part four. But just remember, have fun out there. This is a, fly fishing is a, an endeavor that will give you an opportunity for lifelong learning. I've said that before, it's so, so true. There's so many resources out there on entomology. Take it easy, relax, and uh, go catch some fish. I'll see you in part five when I talk about flies. Okay, take care.